Hello, and welcome to Securities Lending Saturday with Pierpoint. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel, and if you are interested in learning about the fundamentals of securities lending, then this is the place for you. Each Saturday at 1 p.m. BST, we take a look at one element of securities lending from a fundamentals point of view. Now, we do it on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, but because sometimes videos are hard to find on Facebook and LinkedIn, the full episode is available on YouTube on our channel. So you have 10 minutes to switch over. I uh, hope you'll be able to join us there. Um, but uh, other than that, let's get straight to it. I'm just going to bring up the slides. So um, here we are. I want to welcome you all again. And one of the things that I started off four weeks ago is that um, I was going to start with an Ask Me Anything session. And that was really uh, helpful, I think. A bunch of people quite liked that idea. Um, and then it gave a lot of feedback from people that said, in fact, rather than ask a bunch of questions that might be kind of all over the place, it would make more sense to go back to the fundamentals and make certain that basic questions were actually answered. So that's what we've done. Uh, this is week four. The last three weeks, we've looked at really the basics. Why does it exist? Who some of the players are? And what contribution does it make with the statistics that actually apply to the business? <clears throat> so that's what we've talked about so far. Um, what we'll be talking about today is, in fact, um, as I said, we went through securities lending. Why does it exist? Uh, what are the characteristics and statistics? who were the players, stakeholders, and structure. This week, it's about trading drivers, trade execution, and strategies that drive the business. So hopefully uh, that will grab your attention. Uh, but first, let me ask uh, if anyone's out there, tell me where you're actually watching from. Uh, we tend to get uh, quite a diverse global audience, and I'm looking forward to uh, another one of uh, those sessions here today. Let me just get onto the screen. There we go. So now we can look at the full set of slides and we'll just get started. So as I said today, it's about drivers, both from the fundamental market side of the business, but then what triggers securities borrowing or lending activity. Then how does that happen with the execution? And we'll talk a little bit about sort of pricing strategy and utilizations. So uh, thanks very much for the viewer that's uh, just come in from Hong Kong. I can't see your name here, uh, but this is just a quick reminder to everyone that um, in 10 minutes, we will be switching, or in fact, five minutes now, we'll be switching over to YouTube. So if you haven't uh, joined us there yet, go to that link. That will take you through to our um, our channel. Um, if you want to just skip right to it and, and go to the channel itself, I'll bring that up again in a second. But as I said, at uh, 110, we'll be switching to YouTube. So if you're looking at the introduction bit here on LinkedIn or Facebook, and you want to see the rest of the show, no problem. Go over to our YouTube channel, which is listed there and you'll be able to see the whole thing either live, hopefully you can join us now and ask questions and make comments, or if not, then we love uh, people that watch it in replay as well because uh, that means you're spending your valuable time uh, either live or on replay, and we really appreciate it. So uh, let's get to it. Right, so I realize this is a little bit of a busy slide, so we'll take this kind of in stages over the next few minutes. Um, the right hand of it, right hand side, so where we have the hedging and the arbitrage and the directional trading, I've kind of put a little line marker down the middle here because those are market related trading activities. So think of that, that's the trading drivers. And then the left hand side of it, the operational issues and collateral transformation <clears throat> those are other drivers behind it, but driven for other reasons. And we'll go into both of those as well. So this is what actually uh, creates the need for the business. 
uh, if we just take it from the top, start off with hedging. When we talk about hedging, I remember what we're talking about here is not the securities lending trading itself. What we're talking about is the fundamental market activity that drives the uh, subsequent borrowing of securities. Okay, So these are the market trades, and because of the market trading activity, it creates a need to borrow securities. Okay, uh, Just a quick reminder that uh, in three minutes, uh, I'll be switching over to YouTube only, so hopefully you can join me there. Um, now, what I was saying is the hedging activity. When we talk about hedging activity, what we mean is someone has a long exposure to the market. They have a, a portfolio or a stock uh, or a bond or really a diversified portfolio, or they have some kind of exposure to the market, and they like that exposure. They think that portfolio uh, and their holdings are what they want to have, but they might be concerned that uh, events beyond their control might happen. There might be some kind of liquidity event in another market that impacts them, or as with the some of the action last year in February and March, triggered by oil price disputes uh, between Russia and Saudi Arabia that, ha- that started uh, a, a knock-on effect that had some impact on the market. So whatever the reason, people like their portfolio, they're concerned that there might be some event that impacts the value of their portfolio. So what they want to get is short exposure so that if the market moves against them, they'll make some profit from the short positions, which will offset the losses on the core portfolio, which remember they're happy with. They might think that in six months, nine months, five years, this is a great portfolio. But what I want to do is just give myself a little bit of protection. And as the second point says there, um, in the event uh, of a continually rising market, well, of course, what that means is the amount of hedge that you need to have also increases. So the amount of shorting increases, therefore the amount of borrowing activity increases. So that's why you find in markets that are constantly rising, you actually have higher and higher short selling activity because it's about hedging activity. The second point is arbitrage. And what I'm talking about here is it, it, as it says, it captures mispricing opportunities. What do I mean by that? If you think of a very simple example, um, you might have a stock index that's worth X. And then there's the portfolio value of the underlying stock. So in the S&P 500, that's a theoretical price that you can trade the futures on that relates to a portfolio of 500 stocks underlying it. Now, typically, there will be a slight differential between that because uh, if you buy stocks, you have to uh, pay commissions or a spread. Uh, You have to pay a custodian. There might be withholding taxes on any dividends. Um, So there's lots of charges that might be involved in holding a physical portfolio that don't apply to a derivatives portfolio, although derivatives have their own associated costs. But they'll tend to trade within a fairly consistent range of difference. If that difference goes out of whack, up or down, then there might be an opportunity to short one of those assets and go long the other asset to capture that spread when it returns to its historical norms. So you're not really taking a view of either the underlying asset or the asset it's related to. You're just trying to capture a difference between the prices. That's what we mean by arbitrage. Uh, We're now at the 10 minute stage. So uh, to everyone that's been watching us on Facebook and LinkedIn, thanks very much. Please join us on uh, YouTube, uh, either live or maybe subsequently. Other than that, I'm now going to switch to YouTube only. So if you just give me a second, there goes Facebook and there goes LinkedIn. So now we're back to just YouTube. So again, what we're talking about here is the fundamentals of securities lending for anyone that's uh, just joining us. Uh, we're in the middle of uh, focused on being focused on the borrowing demand drivers I've just talked about arbitrage, where you're trying to capture mispricing differences. Other examples might be where a stock, the same stock, trades in two different markets and might have slightly different prices. 
or because of foreign exchange movements, it causes short-term uh, differentials, or an exchange-traded fund and the underlying assets. Really, the same principle applies as the futures versus underlying that I talked about. So that's an arbitrage trade. And then, of course, there's one that everyone thinks about when they think about short selling and, and securities lending. And what they're thinking about there is uh, the price of a stock or a bond is at 10 today. And you know what? I think it's going to go down. So I'm going to sell high and hopefully buy back in future at a lower price. And the difference is my profit. And of course, if I think something is uh, way overpriced, my profit potential in my investment thesis is bigger than if I think it's a marginal uh, difference. Okay, so directional trading has its own challenges. Maybe in future weeks, uh, we'll look at that. Uh, I'm I'm interested uh, in hearing from everyone there uh, in the audience. Do you want to hear uh, uh, more about the underlying trading strategies that drive uh, the uh, hedging trading, the arbitrage trading, or the directional trading. Let me know what you think in the comments below, uh, and we can put together future shows on that. So all of the things that I've just talked about, the hedging, arbitrage, and directional, that all causes market trading activity, short selling activity. And what that means then is that uh, there is a need to borrow securities, and that borrowing then um, uh create securities lending demand. Um, just a quick comment. I've had, uh, I've got some uh, distortion on my sound. Uh, if anyone's having a problem with the sound, uh, please, uh, please make a comment. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to continue because everything looks fine and it was a short term blip. Okay. So we talked about the right hand side. Now let's talk about the left hand side of this chart. And what we're talking about here are two things, lateral transformation, which I'll talk about on the next slide, a dedicated slide to it, because it's really fundamentally important to the revenues and the scale of the business over recent years. And then the second part, which is operational. And what I mean by operational here is that if I'm a stockbroker and my customer says, Roy, please sell me, sell my stock for me. Uh, I might go do a sell execution and sell that stock on the stock market. And that means that I have to deliver those securities into the market. But what happens if my customer has some kind of a problem getting me that stock? Well, then not only do I have a problem with my customer, but now the market has a problem with me because I haven't delivered it to them. And maybe they sold it to someone else and you can see the knock on. So one of the things that I might do is while I'm waiting for my customer to deliver me that stock, I might borrow the stock so I can satisfy the market side of the transaction and keep everything running efficiently. And then I'll sort out the problem eventually with, uh, with my customer. So that's what I mean uh, by uh, resolving operational settlement issues. That's really the, the history of the business. The vast majority of the volume in the past has been driven by this kind of smoothing the plumbing, resolving problems, greasing the wheels of settlement activity, whatever you, way you want to describe it. Uh, that's really what the history of it is. Um, now it's much more uh, trading oriented. And certainly from a revenue point of view, the revenue comes from all of the other boxes. So operational process is really important for market efficiency, but maybe less so from a revenue point of view. I hope that all makes sense to you. I'm just going to take a quick drink. I really feel like I drink so much Coke that they should sponsor this program, but we remain ad free um, for the moment. So uh, that's, that's borrowing demand drivers. Now, I mentioned collateral transformation. The reason I mentioned collateral transformation is because it is a fundamentally important part of the business. What do we mean by collateral transformation? If you look at the boxes in the upper right hand there, um, what we have is someone who is an HQLA taker. HQLA stands for high quality liquid assets. 
And that's a defined term in banking regulations. So people will understand what that means. But the acronym for that is HQLA. And what we're talking about is in the uh, left-hand box there, we have someone that wants to get HQLA. And we'll talk about why they need that in a minute. But right now, they just need it. And then you have someone else in the other box who has it and will give it up. And so these two come together and the HQLA giver is giving higher quality collateral, which is what the middle box says. They give that to the taker and the taker gives what's considered to be lower quality collateral to that giver. And of course, for the privilege of receiving the HQLA, they will pay a fee. So these guys are protected by the lower quality collateral. They might take a higher value of it to uh, offset some of that risk. But now let's talk about why this even exists. So it's really been driven in the period after Lehman Brothers because regulators saw that, in fact, about a year before Lehman Brothers uh, fell apart, the U.S. subprime uh, catastrophe began. And what we saw in markets was that even before the stock market was affected, the short-term borrowing and lending cash market really froze up. People were concerned that their counterparties were very risky. And so what they did was uh, try to borrow as much money as they could, and sometimes they couldn't. And it's these liquidity crises that uh, were this lack of available short-term funding that actually put many firms out of business. So a lot of the um, defaults or insolvencies or government takeovers that we've seen, in fact, come from this fact that these banks that used to fund themselves on a short-term basis all of a sudden couldn't fund themselves on that basis because the um, short-term money markets froze up. So regulators saw this and they got concerned and they said, you know what? To protect the financial industry in future occurrences of these same tight liquidity conditions, we regulators are going to put a requirement on banks to show that they can continue to operate for 30 calendar days, irrespective of whether the money markets are open or not. So it's kind of like a store of cash, and it's based on the value of the bank's cash outgoings for a month. So regulators look at it and say, what are your figures for outgoing? Now you need to hold back reserves that will give you the opportunity to raise cash if we get into the kind of summer of 2007 that spilled over into 2008 conditions sometime in the future. So it's driven by regulatory requirements that allow banks to operate in a closed liquidity environment. So that's why it exists. What kind of assets are high quality liquid assets? Well, I guess the definition of it is, is really it's an asset that you can change quickly from its asset state into cash. And not only that, but at a price that is the last time you valued it uh, without too much price disruption. Okay, again, what do I mean by that? Think of your house or your condo or a property you live in. Well, you know what? The truth is, uh, you can look at that as being a very illiquid asset. If I want to sell that, I have to get estate agents involved. Um, I have to pay taxes like stamp duties in many countries. I have to get listings. I have to get people in to look at it. Um, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that goes into turning that property back into cash. But if I want to sell it really quick and I make it worth half the price that it is on the market, that process can go pretty quick. If I'm selling a million dollar house and offering it for half a million dollars, look, I don't think many people will have to go too much, go through too much paperwork to say, you know what, I can get a million dollar house for half a million dollars 
even if I'm wrong by 50%, it's still quite a nice deal. And so you could turn an illiquid asset into a liquid asset, but of course you'd have to take a huge price discount to make it liquid. And that's really what we mean by saying that it has to be able to be converted to cash with little or no loss of value. What kind of assets are those? Well, of course, in the green box where the green highlights, you can see here's some examples. Level one and level two are just uh, technical terms, so don't worry too much about that. But what we mean by that are, you know, these are typically, you know, cash itself, of course. If you have cash, you don't need to turn it to cash, so that's good. Um, but cash is kind of a wasted asset. While it's sitting there in a bank, the bank isn't earning anything from that. So they don't like to really hold cash. They want to put their cash to work, which is why they buy assets. Now, so cash is one thing. The most obvious one is government bonds because government bonds are usually very liquid assets. And even if they aren't liquid because of market conditions, generally the central bank of a country will take that as collateral against money loans to the banks that they regulate. So it can be converted to cash very quickly. And, you know, these assets typically government bonds at times of crisis. In fact, they go up in value rather than go down. So they're great assets from a regulator's point of view. And in some cases, government guaranteed assets can also be considered high quality liquid assets, but not always. Okay. Now, the final point there is really important. In order to qualify as an HQLA asset, it has to be from active markets with proven liquidity. The asset itself has to have low volatility because no point saying that this is equivalent to cash if it really isn't. That would end up causing uh, more problems than it would be worth. And then the final thing, just as a general guide, it's always on when we hear about a crisis, we talk about a flight to quality. So if it's the kind of asset that someone buys when Lehman defaults, or there's a banking crisis, or there's a political crisis, then that would really qualify as a flight to quality asset <clears throat> and is probably an HQLA asset. Now, this uh, chart here that I'm showing you. Uh, is really over the last year, as it says, the source is IHS Market, who, who collect securities finance data. And what this is showing us in that orange line where I've drawn the red arrow from beginning to end is that shows the amount of assets that are on loan for European government bonds and the growth over the last year. So you can see it's been a pretty significant growth uh, figure. So now the right-hand scale shows that it's probably in excess of uh, 330 billion euro worth of government bonds on loan. And the thing about these European government bonds that are actually on loan is that they're almost all being used for these kind of collateral transformation trades. So you can see this skyrocketing growth applies in real life. So this isn't just a theoretical regulation. What these banks are doing is they're either stockpiling the assets for regulatory reasons, or if they already have enough of those assets, they also can use that as collateral for uh, counterparties that are much more discriminating about the kind of collateral that they take. Next week, we'll talk about collateral more, and that'll become more uh, clear. Okay, so that's collateral transformation. Uh, just a quick thing. Look, if you find uh, these videos helpful, uh, then we'd really appreciate if you give us a thumbs up. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed and you're interested in securities lending activity, that's what this channel is all about. We do nothing but securities lending uh, and short selling related videos. Uh, we also touch on to other securities finance areas like repo, collateral management, and um, uh, prime brokerage. But this is the place to be. So subscribe and ring a bell, ring the bell, so you don't miss any future videos. And now let's get back to it. Okay. So uh, how do securities lending trades work? So, so far, what we've talked about is only the market tra trading side of things. This is about securities lending trades. So the most straightforward way, as you see, is direct messaging. If I'm a lender and you're a borrower or I'm a borrower, you're
or a lender, then what I'll do is I'll send you a message. I want to borrow ABC stock. Do you have it? And you'll say yes or no. We might send a few messages back and forth. Of course, I could also do the telephone. Uh, that's kind of how we did it in the old days. Um, but this is not really used for the most widely available stock because you know what? If I want to borrow shares in Apple or Microsoft, I don't need to ask you whether you've got them because the truth is if you're in this business, you've got the supply. So I don't need to send you a message like this. This is really much more for uh, stocks where they're hard to find. Everyone wants to borrow them or I've got something uh, that's just come up. Uh, I had a loan. Someone else loaned me the stock. But for whatever reason, they've asked for it back. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll put a, a comment in uh, about uh, the characteristics so you can understand the reasons why someone can ask for stock back. So we'll put that into uh, the video uh, after we've, uh, after either in the description or in, in the video later. But uh, so I borrowed a stock. Whoever lent it to me has asked for it back, and I'm now scrambling around trying to find someone to substitute that with. So what I'll do is I might send a message to some of my relationships directly to say, hey, uh, do you actually have stock available for me? I'm um, getting a little bit of feedback again about, about sound, so uh, if there's a problem, uh, apologies for that. Um, hopefully it's not too bad and will go away. Um, and I'll carry on. So uh, what we have is uh, direct messaging. That's pretty effective uh, for these one-off, really urgent type issues. And that might be done, as I said, by telephone. I could send you a Bloomberg message because people use Bloomberg messaging quite a lot in this, or I might send you an email. So that's method one. Uh, if we look now at um, method number two, what, what you find is where the vast majority of activity happens. So this is all about trading platforms. And I've given an example of Equilend, who is one of the, the main industry utilities for the business. And they have a platform called NGT. And I've just flashed uh, some stats here. Uh, this is from their website. So this is publicly available. Um, I'll include a, a link in the uh, show description afterwards. But just to give you an idea, it, this is uh, last month, we've seen over 2 million trades got done that month. So you can see why automation is so critical to this business. And those 2 million trades had a value, a notional value of $2.2 .2 trillion. Okay, so think about that. It's a huge figure there. Um, and you'll see here if you you know look at this at your leisure um, on replay, uh, but you'll see that it's both equities and fixed income get traded electronically. Uh, you'll see the month on month movement, so that's useful to know. Uh, and you know in this case we've seen more trading in Asia, um, flat in Europe and Canada, a bit of a drop in the U.S. in equities, uh, and fixed income was down just generally. But some interesting statistics. 2 million trades for the month, $2 trillion of value. As you can imagine, automation is fundamental to this. You can't really have people getting involved with 2 million individual trades to get them done. The third example is, is also sort of an electronic um, methodology. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the third method is also electronic where uh, rather than send you, sending you an individual transaction by transaction message, as per example number one, what I'm going to do is send you a file. Uh, I'll send you a file of stocks I'm looking for or stocks that I have that I think you are looking for, and we might do some automated trade execution there. Or if it isn't fully automated, you might uh, have maybe 60, 70, 80% of it done automatically, and then it's just a, a negotiation of a bulk basket of stocks with minor variations. So. Uh, could come in any of those three ways. That's how the trades get done. That's an idea of the volumes. And just as an FYI, typically there's about 3 million, between 2 and 3 million trades outstanding. So what you can see is this is kind of a monthly turnover. Every month there might be the equivalent of 2 million 
new trades. Uh, sometimes substituting, as I talked about, if I have a loan and I substitute it with another lender, that's another trade. But on an ongoing basis, uh, 2 million to 3 million trades uh, each and every month. Okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about how lenders go about generating revenue and what they do is two different strategies. And in truth, people have a blending between the two. But one of them on one extreme is called intrinsic value. And what the lender here is trying to do is capture the most revenue that they can get with the fewest transactions possible. So they're trying to capture the loans that they can make for a very high fee, but not a lot of uh, number of transactions, not a lot of settlement costs, uh, fewer operational uh, transactions because all of the post-trade support, maintenance, administration involves work. And so the more trades you have outstanding, the more work. And so what these people are trying to do is they're trying to say, let me find the ones where there's more demand for borrowing than there is supply. So I want to focus on those highly in demand securities so I can make the majority of my money from the fewest number of transactions. And so as we talk about in the practical application, there's a couple of terms for this, which I will describe to you in a couple of slides, but the, these would be warms and specials and super specials and hot stocks. There's lots of different names, but this is where there's quite a lot of demand. Now, the impact of taking this strategy and approach is that the fees they earn per dollar of asset at risk or on loan, because they're really equivalent, is going to be higher than average because the amount of money that they're making, because they're only focusing on the very in-demand securities, of course, is going to be high. And that high fee is going to be spread out over a lower value of assets. And so the uh, return will be higher than average. But that also means that they're focused on a lower market share. And that in itself has implications. Now, who's this good for? Well, this is for people that are very opportunistic. You know, I'll lend this stock and make quite a high return, but I don't need to look at the rest of my portfolio. I just want to generate some extra return. Or for people with uh, relatively small portfolios, but in emerging markets or in uh, technology, maybe emerging technology companies where there's a lot of focus or possibly in future stocks that have good ratings in ESG or bad ratings in ESG. And again, I'll come back to this in a future episode, no doubt. The other thing is, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks when we get to risk, but often a, an investor who's who we call a lender in this example will employ an agent. And again, if you go back to the uh, structure of participants and players uh, episode, you'll get an understanding of who those participants are. And if you're watching live, you can check it out in a uh, previous uh, live stream from this channel as well. So these agents who are working on behalf of the end investor may provide a level of protection called an indemnity, where they say, we'll lend out your stocks to an agree agreed list of borrowers that you and I agree on, but if something happens to them, what we'll do is we'll sell the collateral we're holding, we'll buy back the assets that you had and we lent out on your behalf, and now we're gone because that entity is gone, and we'll make you whole. We'll buy back those stocks. You'll, you'll end up in the same place you started. So that's in many ways an insurance policy, although they hate when you call it an insurance policy because it's not an insurance policy, it's an indemnity. Uh, but the subtleties are very you know, minor. Um, so this, though, of course, is a risk for the bank because now the bank is kind of uh, potentially uh, picking up the tab for any problems that might happen with the borrower community. And their regulators say, well, hold on, we don't mind you doing that, but if you're going to do that, what you need to do 
is set aside capital. So one of the reasons why some agents will look at this intrinsic value strategy where there's fewer assets by value on loan, but higher fees is they may have limited capital that they want to allocate to the securities lending business. Intrinsic value lending meets that criteria. So this really captures, as it says in the bottom line, the majority of revenue with a minority of costs. So that's that's intrinsic value lending. Uh, we'll now go to um, the second strategy. As it says in the uh, in the comment below, if you like this, if this is giving you some value, please give us a, a thumbs up or a like. We'd appreciate that. It helps us reach more people, share this information with a wider uh, community of people. And, uh, and that's, of course, what we're all about. Uh, so please do that. And again, uh, if you want to see future videos, don't forget to subscribe. Um, strategy number two, absolute return. As the picture indicates, this is about making as much money as you can. It's about capturing the maximum revenue. And so here, rather than trying to focus on the securities that are most in demand, we're just trying to meet whatever the demand is, widely available uh, or really narrowly available and really thinly available. The truth is I want to cover the whole spectrum. I want to lend out anything I can possibly do because all I want to do is make money. So I need to get as much on loan as I possibly can. That's what we mean by absolute return. It's the absolute amount of money. What that means statistically, of course, is if I have quite a lot of stocks on loan, that my return on average per dollar of risk will be lower. Because not only am I lending out the high value stocks, I'm also lending out the low fee stocks. So the amount of return I get per dollar um, is lower. So this is good for people that are really comfortable with securities lending risks. You know, they like the counterparties that they've chosen. Uh, if uh, I believe that my lender has quite a lot of capital and their indemnification will be good, then I might feel comfortable with it. And of course, that means that the agent who's providing that indemnification also has to have a lot of capital. And then again, we'll talk about this in collateral, but if you take cash collateral, there's an opportunity to reinvest it. So at certain times of the market, you can make incremental returns uh, without necessarily taking on more risk. Uh, or if you feel comfortable with taking risk in money markets, you can do that in, in, in a wider uh, time frame. Um, and that gives you extra opportunity. So what you want to do is you want to lend as much as you can to get as much cash in as you can so you can play around in money markets if that's the thing that turns your crank. Of course, every bit of return generates an element of risk. That's why we'll talk about it in the risk session. And then, of course, the other angle of this is that if I'm a bank that's doing lending for my clients, and in each of these global markets, and we said securities lending is running in more than 40 markets around the world, what we mean is that uh, if I'm using my subsidiary in 20 or 30 or even five of those markets, and I'm moving a security and that generates a charge, well, if I'm generating a charge and it's going from one pocket of mine to another pocket of, pocket of mine as an organization... I'm going to be less concerned than if I have to pay a foreign bank the movement fees because at least I'm keeping the revenues internal. So it's easier for a large bank with a large network of their own that they use around the world to follow this kind of absolute return strategy. Because as the bottom line there says, the idea is to capture as much revenue as you can but of course, that will generate more trades, more transaction volume, and therefore more fees. So it's not for everyone. Now, as I said, most firms are somewhere in between that. Okay, so two strategies. Uh, one is intrinsic value. The other is absolute return. Uh, just a, a quick point here. If you, um, if you want to learn more and you find this uh, interesting, you can go to our website, which is circled there. Uh, we have free courses. So this uh, primer on securities lending gives you a very high level overview. 
uh, and that lasts about, uh, I think it's about 50 minutes. So it'll give you from beginning to end about securities lending in, in one hour or less. Uh, and then, of course, we have paid courses as well, which go into quite a lot of depth on each of these topics. Uh, and then for those of you who need this for regulatory purposes, it comes with uh, continuing professional development credits. Uh, these are all sort of online on demand, so it's convenient uh, and you can watch them and participate whenever you like. Right, so quick summary of uh, where we go or what we talked about today. One was the drivers of the business. So there's trading strategies in the market that end up creating borrowing demand, which creates the need to borrow securities. There are regulatory requirements like the HQLA collateral transformation I talked about, where banks need to pile up and store liquidity in the event of a crisis. And then the third part, where it's about operational efficiency to smooth the settlement process. For securities lending trading, there's three different ways of doing it, individual uh, trading, automated networks, and bilateral trading. Uh, and do you know what? I've just realized I completely skipped the slide. So please bear with me. We'll go back because this will, I think, be useful to you. I'm not sure where it went. Here it is. This is the slide I missed. And this is about the factors that influence pricing. So we've talked about high value and low value. But what I haven't told you is what determines high value or low value. So that's what we're going to do now before we get back to the summary. All right. The wonders of live streaming. Right. So securities lending is very much, as it says at the top line, a secondary market trading activity. So people don't just borrow securities for the fun of it. They always have to have some kind of driver, whether that's a trading side of things uh, or whether it's operational efficiency or whether it's regulatory driven. There's always something else happening. So securities lending is reactive in that sense. Now, we call it trading. And of course, there is an element of trading involved with it. But the difference is when I think of a trader, I think of someone that takes a risk position. If I'm going to buy GameStop, then hopefully GameStop price goes up, right? I'm taking a risk that it might go down. But securities lending trading, in many ways, as long as your counterparty stays in business, you don't really have that much risk. You still have residual risk, but the main one is that your counterparty is still in business because if they're still in business and they fail to live up to their part of the contract, you can take them to court. That's the value of having contractual relationships. So as long as your counterparty stays in business, so you're not, so it's really much more of a relationship business in this sense. And it's not about risk taking in the position because if I lend out GameStop, well, contractually my counterparty has to give me all the equivalent value, whether GameStop goes up or goes down, whether it makes a dividend or not a dividend, if it goes through a stock split or doesn't have a stock split, whatever I start with, my counterparty has to give me back. I have to end up with that. So from that point of view, counterparty selection is important. And so when I'm doing an individual trade, it's not about risk taking other than selecting the counterparty to trade with. It's much more about negotiating for the transaction that really is the best set of terms. And I'll talk about the terms in just a second. But I'm trying to negotiate for the best series of factors. So price, collateral, dividend, counterparties, all of that. That's what I'm trying to do. And because securities lending is really supply demand 101, we have really a fundamental economic business here. If there's a lot of stock available for loan and not much borrowing activity or demand to borrow that, that stock, then people aren't going to pay a very high fee for it because there's a pile of stock there. And you, if you want to lend it to me, you have to make it a really low price because if you don't lend it to me, that's okay. I have 10, 20, 50 other people I can borrow it from. 
So give me your best price. Pile them high, sell them cheap. And that's what we would call in that upper uh, area here, easy to borrow, or we call it general collateral, or we call it GC for short. So that means supply exceeds demand. And you can see that the criteria here is wide availability, low demand, generates a very low fee. On the other end of the extreme, we have high demand and limited availability. There's not many people holding this stock. GameStop is a great example, right? There's not many people in the middle of January that were holding GameStop that were lenders that had any excess supply. All the GameStop stock was on loan. So if I'm a new short seller in the middle of January, it's going to be hard for me to find someone to lend me that stock. And if I find them, well, you know what? They are going to charge me a bomb for that because they can lend it out to just about anyone. Okay. So that's what we're talking about with high demand and low availability. The fees will, of course, be very high for that. And most of it's in between. Um, you know, warm or mid-level pays a little bit more than GC. Hard to borrow stocks or hot stocks pay more than these. And specials or super specials pay even more. And so there's a there's about right now, for example, I think that there's about $30 billion of stocks on loan today that generate fees of 500 basis points or more per annum. So that's a super high fee on a really large volume of business. And so as this box here says, it's not unusual to see the majority of revenues generated by a tiny minority of the securities on loan. Because Apple, which generates maybe a tenth of a percent a year on its fees, is going to have a hard time competing with the latest you know, GameStop or AMC is now also uh, ripe for a short squeeze, according to uh, many people. So what we have is um, very high fees for those sorts of stocks. And so the amount that they generate will be disproportionately large compared to the value that they represent out of the outstanding portfolio. So supply demand. If you take away one message, this is about supply and demand. Now, the interesting thing that we talked about in the very first session was that you can renegotiate the price because supply and demand changes over time. So if all of a sudden uh, people don't want to borrow GameStop anymore and a lot of the short sellers that closed out their, or closed out their transactions so no longer need to borrow it, whether they made a profit or not is immaterial, but they they don't have a short position anymore. So all the people that used to lend out GameStop, it's sitting there collecting dust and they want to earn some money from it. So if I'm borrowing the stock from an expensive lender and there's a cheaper lender out there, well, of course, I'm going to go to them. And so it gets adjusted. I can go back to you and say, you know what? You are lending it to me too expensive. Give me a lower price or I'll go somewhere else. You have the option to say, well, my rate is my rate. If you don't like it, go somewhere else, and then we can agree to part ways. So supply, demand, and renegotiation throughout the life of the transactions is acceptable. Now, the other thing is because a borrower has to make a lender whole, uh, if there's a dividend on a stock uh, and I've borrowed it from you, I have to give you the amount of dividend that you would have got after tax. So quite often I'm looking for people that suffer a lot of tax because the amount of money I have to give them is less. So if a stock generates $100 of dividends and you suffer 15% withholding tax as an investor, then I have to give you $85 equivalent for it. But if you suffer 30% withholding tax or 25% withholding tax or 20% withholding tax, well, you know what? It's cheaper. So if I have two lenders, one that gets 80, that would cost me $85 of dividends and another that might cost me $75, I'm going to the $75 one because it's just cheaper for me. It's the equivalent of a cheaper fee. It's just another aspect of it. 
The final piece is collateral. So again, we'll talk about this next week, but every investor is entitled to set their own collateral criteria, what they will accept as collateral on loan. But of course, that has cost implications. So again, a borrower will always look for the cheapest cost of collateral. And none of these factors on their own decide it. That's why I was talking about it's the best fit. So what's the fee? What's the dividend requirement? What's the collateral? And then there's relationships on top of that. Right? And there's consistency and there's lots of intangibles that also influence uh, pricing and who I go to in the first place. So uh, those are the factors that influence pricing. Uh, we've talked about all the rest. So we go back to the trading, the trading execution and we talk about the strategies. As I said, supply and demand 101, different utilization strategies or blended. So it's important to understand what the drivers are and what if you're going to use a service provider, what's their approach to the business? And does that actually fit with you? Because the different strategies will generate different outcomes and, of course, have different risk profiles as well. So that's the summary. Uh, remember, uh, next week, it's actually part five, which is collateral. This is Saturdays at 1 p.m. BST. If you have questions, put them in the comments. Uh, otherwise, I hope to see you next week on Securities Lending Saturdays, and we go through the fundamentals of the business. So thanks for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't given us a like or subscribe yet, think about doing it, and I'll see you next week.